then. So happy to have Eric Calder back with us today to do a part two to talk about what he's doing at Val. And last time we were talking about how Eric wanted to be an investor and then was tired of uh, CEOs taking lavish vacations, cooking the books, and then he came across the white paper of Bitcoin and now he's doing all sorts of cool things. So we got a lot of positive feedback from the last one. And now we want to talk about what you're doing at Val and how that's impacting not just cryptocurrency, but what your your main focus is like leveling the playing field for everyone economically. Yeah. So let's let's talk about what's going on at Val. Oh my God. There's so much going on. Um but we should probably talk about what Val is first. Yeah, what exactly is Val to like anyone that hasn't heard of it? Um, because I haven't heard of it before we met, before we did the first first episode. Yeah, um, you know, to be honest, it's a project that's been kind of under wraps, right? Because we've just been busy building, and we haven't really focused on making a big splash and and getting the, you know, the the whole community thing. Um, we're actually very focused on the customer. So uh, let me let me just see if I can uh, state a synopsis. About what, do, what does VAL even stand for? Does it just sound, like stand for anything or is it just like vowing to do good for humans? Uh, yeah, that's it. Actually, that's exactly. <laughs> okay. So our slogan today is we vow to change the world, right? And everyone who is in the community has that sentiment. Uh, they they truly, I mean, it's a community of true believers because um, if if the problem is central banking, the solution is about, the, de the solution is the decentralization of currency issuance, right? So think about how, where dollars come from. Well, they come from the Federal Reserve. It's 12, well, again, not to be, um, what was the term? Um, not to be insulting, but it's twelve monkeys in a black room making some decisions about stuff uh, for the rest of us. So th this is this is a problem. Uh, I mean, you know, for a long time, and I think we talked about this last time. You know, Americans didn't want a central bank. They tried twice, and then they snuck it under the under the covers. Uh, and there's a reason why why people don't want central banks. And it's because the discretion to print money is really the source of power. And by having a central bank, then you have just one set of people, a small set of people having a great deal of power and everybody else gets disempowered, right? So if the problem is central banking, then VAU is the solution. And how does VAU decentralize currency issuance? Well, actually, it's quite simple in, in some ways, right? Anyone can issue a currency. Uh, I mean, even before before blockchain, right? Before the, the invention of Bitcoin, um, you could just print your own notes and, um, and, and hand them to people. The problem is who's going to accept them, right? Because what are they worth? And it's a chicken and egg problem. They're not worth anything because no one will accept them and no one will accept them because no, because they're not worth anything. So issuing your own currency isn't, isn't really a big problem. The problem is getting people to accept the currency. So Val, the, the Val project took the approach of, well, what is currency anyway, right? Uh, actually, currency is a product. Uh, and people, I mean, economists, you know, will deride me perhaps um, for saying something like that. You know, the, the reality is that money, so currency is a form of money and money is an asset. It's basically like debt, right? Like a promissory note. It's a promise that it's going to be there. Yeah, it's, well, yes. From that perspective, it is like it. And this is part of the problem is that it's, there's a lot of things that are like this, but not exactly. So money is not debt. But it yeah, because like last time you were like, Bitcoin has a finite supply. Right. Yeah. So okay. So that brings us into another issue, which is, which is m money more generally versus real money, 
right? So I like to I like to talk about Bitcoin as being real money because the there's like there's like several there's at least three different functions to money. So money as a tool, right? That we that we created in order to facilitate trade. It has to it it sort of serves three different functions. The first is is I can send it and receive it. So uh, it, it, as um, as the other side of a trade. So in other words, it's a settlement currency. It's used to settle a transaction where real goods change change hands in the real world. The second uh, function of it is once I've received money for my products, if my if that if a certain amount of money uh, bought a certain amount of my product, I want that ratio to stay the same across time. So in other words, it has the ability to store the value of the product that I, that I originally manufactured. So right? meaning and, there's no inflation to it. Uh, well, yes, that's, that's one aspect of it. And I mean, to some extent, if you think about money as being the counterpart to every trade in the world, right? So how much money for a, for a dozen eggs, how much money for a pair of moccasins, how much money for a house, et cetera, et cetera. And if you take a snapshot and you say, these are the exchange rates of money against everything else, the value of money can never actually stay the same because the real world is changing, right? Um, there are more people being born and we need more milk and we need more cows and we need more soybeans. And so the ratios of stuff is changing. And, and if we look at it historically, you know, back in, uh, back in the days of the Venetian empire, for example, you could, the, you could buy a dress that was, uh, that was the equivalent price of a castle. Well, you'd be hard pressed to do that today, right? Uh, but that's because, you know, dresses were made of silk and silk had to come from the Orient and there were only so many ships that could go there. And so silk was super, super expensive, but castles were plentiful, right? They, they built them all, there were lots of stone around. So so the, the supply of one thing, real thing versus another is going to change and somehow money has to magically represent the purchasing power when it was received at a later point and, and still be the same. So that's a really, really hard task, but that is in some ways what we expect of money, right? It's a, it's a store of value. And then the third function that it performs is it's a, it's a metric. It's a unit of account, we, we say in economics, but it's, a, it's, it's the way in which we measure things. And we say, oh, this... This is more expensive today than it was, right? Because it's a greater number of whatever we call money. So, so given that money is in fact uh, a product, right? A product whose, so uh, a pair of shoes is a product that you put on your shoes and you use to walk, right? And a, an orange juice is a product that you consume, you put it inside your body. Money is a product whose function is a stand-in for any other product at any later point in time, right? So if it's a product and it's a product that's very ubiquitous, then um, what is the kind of main contact point for the population to come into this product? And the answer is merchants. So Val is a very mercantilist uh, Pro, uh, project or or has a mer very mercantilist structure in that it approaches the merchants and the premise is the following if you're going to a merchant to buy some product or another and we don't we don't care what product it is and that merchant were to give you money you would probably accept it right because you deal with this merchant and, um, yeah, you know, it's, there's a relationship there. So, okay, so, so let's just think about for a second the idea of a corporate currency, right? The merchant starts printing, it's, let's just say Starbucks or, I don't know, Nikes or some big brand, right? 
uh, not to be representative, of a, not not to say that uh, that brand that I pick is you know endorsing Val or anything. But let's just call it. Let's call it Eric Shoe Company. Eric Shoe Company. I love Eric it. Shoe Company. It's a global brand that sells shoes. There we go. So Eric's Shoe Company starts issuing Eric Bucks, right? And uh, well, what can you do with the Eric Bucks? And the answer is well, the only people who will accept it is Eric's shoe company. So we <laughs> get it from Eric's box and you go, oh, okay, uh, you know, that's nice. What is it worth? Well, it's worth something at Eric's shoe company. So I I'll accept it. And right there, bam, you solved a really big problem, which is the acceptance. The customer will accept it because he knows Eric's shoe company will accept it back. And that right there is the core is the is the heart of the magic what has really become a dark magic right the issuance of money relies on the acceptance of money and so the only issue there is that uh the only place where you can spend this money is at eric's shoe company and you just bought a, bought a pair of shoes and you don't need any more shoes for a while so monetary velocity is really slow right then you say, well, what if we had a non-denominational currency where Eric's shoe company and um, you know Joshua's, you know, pantaloon company, uh, <laughs> you know, ha use this same non-denominational currency? What would we call it, right? And the so the brilliant conclusion there was, well, we should. So if we're going to operate in the United States. Um, what are people familiar with already, right? What's the unit of account there? And the answer is, well, dollars. All right, well, then let's just call it, I don't know, about dollars. So by simply picking the name properly, we have solved a cognitive load that is really substantial. When we say it's Eric's shoe company dollars, well, when we say it's Eric's shoe company tokens, right? The first question is, well, how much are they worth? We have no idea. Uh, it, where are they accepted? Well, we presume they're accepted by Eric's shoe company, but we don't, really don't know where else, right? Uh, and um, what are the rules about, right? Because the shoe company issued them, so there must be some set of rules, so we don't know what they are. So there's there's this cloud of stuff where we don't really like know understand and anything that we don't know and understand it's scary so we don't want anything to do with it right but when we say it's about dollar people say well what is it what well, well it's a dollar so okay it's a vow dollar but we don't really know what the vow part is but we know what a dollar is so there's a series of assumptions a, it's worth a dollar. So in, when I think about uh, what a cup of coffee costs, this is $4.50, I make the presumption that it costs $4.50 vow, you know, cents of a vow dollar. And in that presumption, you'd be correct. Uh, I presume that as a dollar, it's accepted everywhere. Well, that's true. It's accepted everywhere, right? Um, I presume that it doesn't expire dollars don't expire so why would about dollars expire and that would also be correct and so by simply picking the 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 name properly you you already establish a relationship uh that the, that the user knows in his heart he just understands it right the only issue is this v in the front it's a v dollar right and and that's easily explainable um, oh, it's a V dollar because you put it in your VAU wallet. We used to have a, a, a wallet. Now, now it's really basically any any wallet, any crypto wallet, right? So it's a because it's the VAU company. It's not actually a company, but VAU ecosystem. And so you go, oh, okay, fine, right? So if Eric's shoe company is going to issue these tokens, these V dollars. In order for them to be acceptable by the public, they have to be taken back by the company that issued them, right? Because I'm only, as a user, I'm only going to accept them if I can use them and potentially at the very same place where I got them, right? 
And so that's why we call this project VOW, because the merchants vow to accept every B dollar that they issue. And it is that vow that is at the heart of what money actually is. So VOW is actually an economic model. Uh, it's a predator, it's, a, it's an apex predator. It's an economic model that outcompetes the, the current economic model. So one of the things that happens when you have a system and you change something very fundamental about the system is that it has just huge implications. VAO takes the existing economic system, which is super, super big and super complex, right? It, it spans the globe and it is in everyone's lives in every possible way. And it serves all of these functions. There's all this money and power, all of this stuff flowing around. And if you wanted to design a competing system, you would have to be able to compete in every way, in every field, right? And that, that would be very difficult to do. But if you just change something very fundamental, something small, then that change could ripple through the existing system and essentially take it over. And that's kind of what VAU does. What VAU does is it creates what we call uh, durable negative money. So we're accustomed to somewhat durable positive money. Uh, and we, we look like that, but we're actually not, right? And so what does that mean? Um, it used to be that Eric's shoe company would go to, uh, you know, Joshua's newspaper company and say, I'd like to print an ad. And the newspaper would say, yeah, what, what, what kind of an ad? And say, well, we'd like, I'd like to say uh, anyone who walks into my store with this little piece of paper, which you can cut out of the newspaper, we'll get 10% off a purchase. And people love that idea because they lo love lower prices, right? So they would read the paper and the paper was like, oh, that's a great idea because more people will read the paper looking for the coupons. So you would show up to the store, bring your, your little coupon. The store would accept it and in exchange for that, give you, in exchange for that little piece of paper and some other other little pieces of paper of the green color, of a, of a green color, right? They would give you shoes. So so in fact, coupons kind of served like a, like a transaction settlement currency, right? But they had a they had an interesting quality to them, which was you had a you had a, a pair of shoes for a hundred dollars and you would walk in with a 10% off coupon one little brown piece of paper and 90 green little pieces of paper. So what happened was the coupon was actually an entitlement to a price reduction. You get to pay $90 of quote unquote real money with the addition of this sort of negative money. And what the merchant would do is take that piece of paper, rip it up, put it in the bin and take a loss of profit. Right, so if if the merchant's margin margin was eighty bucks and he was sell, accustomed to selling the the product for hundred, he had a twenty dollar margin. Now he took a short a short profit of ten dollars. Right, and he's fine fine to do that. But the problem is that he took that little coupon and he tore it up because it's really kind of worthless. And so, you could call that money you could call it negative money, but it was impermanent. Vow took that concept and made it durable. So when a merchant issues V dollars, so you, you come into the store, you buy a pair of shoes for a hundred bucks, put it in your credit card, and the merchant says, well, today we have a sale and we're gonna give you 10 V dollars. And you go, oh, wow, thank you. I, I, I like that, right? So. At some point, I come back into the store and I've got ten V dollars, or or someone who earns the V dollars in some other store comes in, 
right? So, so the merchants, merchants are always happy to have new customers. They'll take the V dollars from someone else. They'll take them from me as well, of course. So they take the V dollars, but rather than tearing them up and putting them in the bin, they can now reuse them. So they take the V dollars from me as I'm coming back into the store and they hand them to you, right? So now you don't have to pay for publishing, right? You pay once for publishing and you have to keep publishing. Now you don't have to pay for publishing. You just keep handing these V dollars around. But more importantly, as the, as the V dollars gain currency, as they, as they, so currency, it comes from the French word courir, which means to run. Uh, currency is, money is currency when it runs, right? When it is acceptable and people are transferring it and, and all this kind of stuff. So um, if I am a merchant and I buy from another merchant, let's say, when I receive the V dollars, I can maybe use those V dollars to, to buy whatever I buy from some other merchant, right? And then all of a sudden you say, oh, well, this looks an awful lot like income. Um, because now not only didn't I tear that up, but I actually got a dollar's worth of product from someone else. It, that means to say, I took this entitlement for a discount in price, which I received from one of my customers, and I used it with another merchant to reduce my price against him, right? And that at that point you go, oh, wow. Well, that's, you know, that's substantively different from the way that we're accustomed to doing things. I mean, the most immediate uh, thought, let's say, that comes comes to mind when, when let's say an accountant looks at this is, hmm, well, this isn't income, therefore it isn't taxable. So right there, the merchant already got a nice boost, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there is, of course, a number of other boosts, and there's there's some real, really powerful magic in in inside some of the, inside a bunch of this. Uh, but another boost is, for example, no sales tax because the price got reduced, right? You pay you pay a sales tax or a VAT tax uh, for whatever you paid for the item, but this is a reduction in price. So the VAT tax get reduced, the income tax get reduced, the fees to the credit card companies get reduced because now you're transacting freely on a blockchain. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the beginning, but um, there is something really amazing that happens for the merchant. How do merchants issue V dollars? Well, the answer is they, they buy VAU and then they stake it. Staking is a process where you take your VAU and you lock it up, right? And in exchange for locking it up, something happens. So we have a smart contract. There's the, the, there's a, a smart contract in the ecosystem, and for those for those in the audience who I, I don't I don't really know if your audience is all that knowledgeable about crypto. I'm sure there's some people, but let's explain it. Sometimes it's good to get back to the basics. Right. Okay. So, um, so a a blockchain is a network of computers that all work together to do something. And what they do is, <laughs> is what we call business logic. It's a, it's a computation of some kind. You feed it some information and it produces some information. And the point of having very many computers instead of a single computer doing this is so that they can all uh, cross check with each other that given some set of inputs, they all produce the same output. And so uh, by having many computers do this, it makes it very difficult for any one computer to cheat. So in other words, a blockchain is essentially a trust machine. It's a, it's, a, it's a device that produces trust. You can trust a blockchain because it's very, very hard to make it cheat. If you set up a set of rules, uh, you have all of these participants that have no interest in colluding with each other, or even if they do, 
there's multiple colluding groups and it's very hard to get the entire network to collude and so you can you can trust the 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 outcome right a smart contract is the piece of business logic that um, um, that is useful to someone somewhere so in the Vau ecosystem uh, which which is running on a layer two blockchain on top of Ethereum, but that's about to change. We're about to uh, basically uh, spawn off our own V chain, um, which is really exciting. Uh, gives us a lot of sovereignty and control over stuff. Uh, in in the Vau ecosystem, there's a smart contract, which if you hand it um, Vau, it will figure out through an oracle what the price of vow is against dollars and then it will mint five times the amount of v dollars or it will figure out which country you're doing this from right so if you're in europe it'll be v euros and if you're in the uk v pounds and we have we have v currencies in 14 different countries we have v rands in south africa and v rupees in india and all this kind of stuff right um so the smart contract will take your vow which incidentally vow is a fixed supply currency like Bitcoin, right? So like Bitcoin, it rises in price uh, as a function of availability. If there's a lot of vow around to be bought, it's cheap like sand, you know, lots of sand in the world, so sand is cheap. Uh, if, if there's not much of it around like gold, then it's expensive. Um, and so the merchant takes the vow hands it to the smart contract and this and the contract sort of ties it up and in exchange it produces five times the value in v dollars or whatever v currency right so the so the merchants in order to generate the v dollars in order to issue new currency they have to put down a reserve currency which is vow and if and as a function of doing that what they're doing is they're going to the market, buying VAU at whatever price, and then locking it up so that they're actually unable to sell it. So, so this is very interesting because merchants, as the primary customers of VAU, are very different than the customers of almost any product in the world, right? In, in two respects. One is they're price insensitive. They're agnostic to price. If Vow is trading at a dollar a token, then a hundred dollars will buy you a hundred tokens, right? But if it's trading at ten dollars a token, then you would, for the same hundred dollars, you would get only ten tokens. Mm -hmm. Pretty much in any market in the world, people would go, "Oh, that's really expensive. I'm going to wait until it falls and then and then buy some more," right? I mean, hell, we have futures contracts markets in the world precisely because of that. Because when the price of copper rises, uh, then my products get more expensive. So I'm always going to try to buy the copper, you know, at a lower price. And so I lock it up. I lock up my purchases through, through uh, futures contracts, right? So everyone in the world cares about price. Vow merchants don't care what the price is because... $100 of VAU will generate 500 V dollars, no matter how many VAU tokens they get, right? So the price of VAU is immaterial to their operations. They will always buy, buy VAU, which, which means a lot of people look at, you know, something like Bitcoin and they say, oh, Bitcoin is at all time highs. This is the worst possible time to buy it, right? You have to wait until it falls and then, you know, play near the top or wait until a deep corruption happens or whatever. And then other people make the argument, well, yes, it's at all-time high, but Bitcoin sets all new all-time highs all the time, so it's okay. So there's all of that argumentation. That doesn't exist in our world. The merchant says every month, I got to issue more discounts, and that means I just have to go buy VAU, and they buy it no matter the price. The second aspect that is significantly different in our ecosystem is that when the merchants buy the VAU, they stake it. So we have this concept of weak hands, strong hands, 
and Val has what we call diamond hands. When a participant in a marketplace purchases something for the sake of selling it, um, they kind of set up a, a, re a desired return, right? Some people trade and they just want a 10% increase, right? So they buy something here and they 10% and they sell it. So they're generally weak hands. There's guys who take a longer investment horizon, right? They, they trade once a month or once a quarter, or they buy something, a position for three years. So they buy and the price is doing this, it goes down, everyone's scared, they don't care because it's gone down, but they made their choice. They're gonna wait three years, whatever. Those guys are called strong hands, right? And strong hands bring stability to markets because when the price is going down, they're not selling, therefore creating additional supply they they just hold maybe they even buy more right so so then they serve as a support line as a resistance line as uh, so, so we have support and resistance right um so they serve as support vow merchants when they buy they stake the vow and they issue the v dollars and while that that vow is staked they cannot sell it so the price can do whatever it does that vow is not coming back to market, right? They're diamond hands. And so this is really an amazing uh, two features for the main participants of a market. We're very different from anything else that's ever existed. And so when does the merchant get its vow back? Well, the answer is if you issued 500 V dollars and you handed them to, to your customers. And by the way, we're actually a proof of transaction network. It means that as a merchant, when you stake the vow, we don't give you, you the V dollars. We give the V dollars to your customers when you prove to us that you did real business in the real world. Right? We do that by having relationships with all of the payment uh, channels out there with Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, and everything. So anytime you put out your credit card and you make a purchase, we pick up that transaction from the backbone and we say, okay, who is the person? And is this person part of the VAO ecosystem? And is this merchant part of the VAO ecosystem? And what was the discount that the merchant wanted to give? 10%. So we send the V dollars out of your pool to that merchant. So the only way that you as a merchant can get your VAO back is by accepting the V dollars back from customers and then bringing the V dollars back to the smart contract and then you can have your vow, right? But what happens, the consequence of locking up so much vow is that there's less availability and therefore the price goes up. Every month, everybody needs to go buy more vow and there's less and less vow in the world because it's all getting locked up. And so the price just rises, right? And how does it rise? Well, um, from a mathematical perspective, a fixed supply, the relationship between supply and demand of a product is, is actually asymptotic. So for those, those of you in the audience who remember, who don't, maybe don't remember your math from high school, an asymptote is an inverse relationship, right? So Y is equal to one over X. As X starts to get really large, Y gets really small. As X gets really small, Y gets really large. So if Y is the price and X is the supply, as the supply approaches zero, as it gets depleted, right, the price approaches infinity. And so this is actually where the great magic of the system is. When the merchants are buying VAU, they're locking it up. It's their VAU, right? It's locked up, but it's, it belongs to them. Because of the competition for VAU, as everybody seeks to buy VAU and the rising price, they now have an asset on the balance sheets that is exploding in value. And the accountants look at this and say, you know, guys, our balance sheet is so healthy right now that we can we can afford to start taking losses on the on the operations. That means we can start discounting all our products sustainably below our, our margin rates we can start selling stuff at a loss because we'll make up the loss in the capital gains of this asset. And of course, if you 
you know, if you if you set this up right, uh, what you do as a merchant is you create a subsidiary in some proper jurisdiction like Panama or New Zealand where there's zero capital gains tax and you hold your vow there and now you start taking operating losses in Germany or whichever country it is where you get taxed, right? And so you're driving down the price and reducing your income tax while you're getting these amazing, not linear, but asymptotic capital gains in some jurisdiction where there's no capital gains tax, right? And at that point, you're like, oh my God, uh, th th that changes everything, right? And one of the things it changes is now that I'm so incredibly profitable and I'm selling my, you know, Eric's shoe company selling shoes at below cost prices, what happens to the guy across the street? He can't, he's sitting there wondering, scratching his head going, how, we can't, do that right like we have costs rubber costs or plastic costs or whatever the shoes are made of and uh, and uh, we we just can't compete so so the answer is either the guy across the street joins the vow ecosystem and starts discounting to come to a level playing field with a, with with me or he dies and that is why Vow is an apex predator, right? It is, it is a thing that is simply superior to the modality of business of, 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 in, in which we're doing business at this point. So, so that was kind of not so. <clears throat> so like, so, if I give you like a unit of currency, where does that money go within Vow? Could you like explain more on that? Um. If you give me a unit, oh, you mean if you give me a V dollar? If I give you like a American dollar or a euro to buy Val currency, what 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 are y'all doing with that currency? Oh, so actually, that's a great question. Um, in the world of blockchain, we have a new kind of structure, something that doesn't exist in traditional finance. It's called a liquidity pool. Uh, sometimes it's also called um, an automated market maker. Um, and let me describe a little bit um, the purpose of it. And, and then I can describe the, the function within the value ecosystem. If I have a pair of moccasins that I want to sell, that I made, I want to sell. I come to you and I go, you know, maybe maybe you you uh, grow berries in your backyard. Right? I go, I, I'd like some of the berries. I've got these moccasins. And you go, well, it's nice, but and thank you, but I've already got a pair of shoes. I go, oh, okay. So I go next door to your neighbor, and he's got, he doesn't have berries. I wanted berries, but he's got peaches. Okay, I'll, I'll take the peaches. And I go, I got moccasins. And he goes, no, I, not today, thank you. And so this is really a a difficult problem, right? It's called the coincidence of once is what we what economists call this. In order for a trade to happen, there has to be a coincidence, which is that two people happen to want what each other wants. So uh, so then what the solution to that is to create a marketplace. We're going to all go to the same place and there we're going to talk to each other rather than having to go house to house, right? And then hopefully we find someone. But still it may be that uh, today nobody wants moccasins, right? Even in the marketplace where there's hundreds of people, no moccasins, okay, fine. Crypto projects have this problem. They, everybody wants to have their own token. So they issue a million of these tokens and the answer is who wants them? It's a coincidence of wants problem, right? So um, when a thing is very desirable, when everybody wants moccasins, that is to say, when there's a large market of buyers for my product, we can say my product is very liquid. Um, it means that if I want to sell it, I can sell it like that. Boom, right? When my product is relatively undesirable, then we say it has very low liquidity. And tokens for a brand new crypto project are usually very illiquid there isn't a buyer for them, right? Because the value isn't yet understood and 
the marketplace hasn't been formed and all this kind of stuff. So somebody had a great idea and I don't even, actually, I don't even know the origins of this. I should, I should probably look it up, but um, they, so in traditional markets, we have some players called market makers. Their function is to provide liquidity. So <laughs> they will buy or sell uh, a thing anytime that someone's at the other end of the trade, right? And why would they do that? The answer is they get incentivized. So um, so here you come with your moccasins and nobody else wants to buy them. I will buy them. Why will I buy them? Because you're the market maker. I'm a market maker. And you have to, you're, you agree to buy or sell regardless of the price. That's correct. And I get incentivized to do that uh, by the marketplace itself, right? So the marketplace is willing to pay me money to take the risk that I buy your moccasins today and that I can't sell them tomorrow. I may have to hold on to those moccasins for a week before I can sell them. <laughs> And I might even have to sell them at a, at a loss, right? But I'm willing to do that because I'm getting paid by the marketplace. So, okay, great. So it's a, it's a good function to, to help facilitate liquidity in a marketplace. So in the DeFi world, in the world of decentralized finance, finance on blockchains, somebody created a smart contract whose only function was to provide liquidity. They called it an automated market maker, right? Automated because instead of being a human being, it's a it's a smart contract and it will buy anything that you have to sell, um, uh, no matter the time of day or no matter the you know whatever right, and it will also sell anything. But how does uh, so this is also called a liquidity pool, right? So how does a pool do that? Well, the answer is in order to so pools usually have a uh, two assets that they trade. So let's just say Val versus V dollars. How does a pool buy V dollars? Well, it has to have Val. How does it buy Val? It has to have V dollars. So in order to set up a pool, what you do is you take a bunch of Val and you buy a bunch of V dollars and you put it into the pool. And now the pool is there 24 seven and it will buy any time you want to sell. You want to sell Val? No problem. You want to sell V dollars? No problem. It is the the counterpart to everyone's trade. So rather than in a typical marketplace, you have a bunch of brokers, right? The broker's job is you go to the broker and say, I want to sell this and they go find you a buyer, right? right? Or I want to buy this, they go find you a seller, right? Rather than having a marketplace where you match buyers and sellers, everybody matches against the, the liquidity pool on the buy side and everybody on the sell side matches against the liquidity pool and the liquidity pool is always there and always has liquidity so it always does the trade so that's that's like amazing right that, that that solves a real world problem that we for well probably 10,000 years worth of trading we hadn't ever figured this out but then the question is what happens is there's a lot of sellers right a lot of people selling moccasins and no one buying them. So the next the next question is, well, that pool will buy your moccasins, but at what price? Because let's just say that, let's just say you put 10 moccasins in the pool and $10. So uh, then you wanna, so what's the price of a moccasin? The answer is $1 because there's 10 of each. So then you come in and you put, another pair of moccasins in the pool and it hands you a dollar. And then I come in and I put another pair of moccasins and then it hands me a dollar. Well, then it, it can only really buy 10, 10 pairs of moccasins, right? Because there were only $10 in there. So that, that wouldn't work very well. So the answer was again, um, a, an inverse relationship, right? We, we go back to, to that mathematical structure that looks like a curve that runs towards infinity. The way, it, the way the pools solve the problem is they dictate the price at which they will buy or sell the item based on the asymptote. So as everybody comes and you know, sells pairs of moccasins into the pool, 
the price of the the market since the price that the pool will pay gets smaller and smaller and as the number of market since approaches infinity the price of them approaches zero so the pool will always be able to buy another pair of moccasins. It will never run out of money, basically, right? Because the price at some point gets infinitesimally small. So that's an amazing invention that doesn't exist in TradFi, in traditional finance, right? And Vow makes uh, extensive use of liquidity pools. Um, so to answer your question, when one dollar comes into the system in exchange for a V dollar or for VAL, that dollar goes into a liquidity pool and it sits there into the, in, in the liquidity providing liquidity for VAL so that you just bought this VAL and you surrendered a dollar, but somebody else might want to sell their VAL and then they take your dollar. And so all these trades happen along this asymptotic curve. So the asymptotic curve ensures that a market can't be manipulated and someone can drive it to zero? Is that like how it acts? That is like so beautifully put. Uh, and that's actually the first, you know, I really like talking to you. Like you really get stuff and uh, and you even paraphrase it in ways I've not heard it. Yes. So one of the one of the big issues- Because it never gets to the limit. So it, it the limit does not exist. Meaning it can't just, you can't, someone can't just like drive the currency to zero. That's, that's correct. But it also means something else, and you just put your finger on something so important. We, so let's, so I was in Morocco 30 years ago, and I, I was in this little town called El Jadida, right, right on the ocean. And um, they have a marketplace there, and all of these men go out with their little boats, I forgot the names of the boats, um, and they, they fish and they come back to the marketplace with the same fish, right? So there's 20 stalls with the same fish. And well, there's some guys in there with some chickens and vegetables and other things, whatever. And so the question is, how many people want fish today? And the answer is very many. Those people are very accustomed to eating fish every day, which is great, right? Because then the fishermen can get to eat, get to sell their fish. So there is a real world relationship between supply and demand, which manages price. Now we started that way and we then, our markets became more and more complex and we financialized them. We started saying, well, how about if I don't sell you the fish today? I'll sell you a promise to sell you a fish tomorrow, right? That's called a futures, a futures contract. And, um, and people, you know, industrial players like gold miners and, and people in the petroleum industry, et cetera, they use futures contracts extensively to, to manage their survivability, right? But it's more complex. It's like, oh, now I have to understand oh, there's a strike price and there's a, a, a term to this agreement and there's delivery <laughs> features, right? And then there's options on top of futures contracts and then there's swaps and then there's all these sort of financialization of the market to the point where now nobody really understands what the actual supply and demand dynamics are. And what does that do? It allows people with large sums of money to manipulate markets, to essentially do stuff with the price that doesn't actually represent supply and demand, right? So, so what happens, and, and I mean, governments do this uh, by, you know, they, they kind of put their finger on the, on the scale, so to speak, by um, incentivizing farmers, I, I forgot the term, I, I, my mind is like, you know, whatever, but um, they, they incentivize farmers not to raise pigs, right? And uh, Benjamin Franklin, back in the day, wrote a really, really funny, humorous treatise about the business of not growing pigs. Because it takes a lot of work to to raise a pig, right? You have to feed him and you have to take care of him when he gets sick and you have to make sure he has babies and all this kind of stuff. And you make a certain amount of money. But then the government steps in and says, hey, 
will give you that same amount of money for not raising the pigs. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah, okay, that sounds like a great idea. But what you're in, in essence is you're what you're doing is you're distorting the marketplace, right? And governments do that and large large players with substantial amounts of capital do that. And we've gotten to the point where we no longer really understand what the the actual dynamics of supply and demand are. So in other words, we don't know what reality is anymore. And liquidity pools bring us back reality because they set the price. There's too much demand, the price fell. There's too much, there's too much supply, the price fell. Too much demand, the price rose, right? And it does so along the curve, it's mathematical. So no one gets to play with the price. This is a marketplace where no one can manipulate. There is no zero corruption, right? So, um, so one of the big problems with the world today is corruption. Everything is corrupt. You know, you have this, this government minister, this functionary who is supposed to, um, supposed to perform a function. Like, for example, you know, um, congressmen, senators, and representatives in, in Congress in the U.S. They're functionaries, right? They're there to perform a function. What's the function? Well, they're there to represent the interests of the American people. Ah, but no, they represent the interests of a bunch of little private groups, right? They, they, they even represent the interests of other nations for some reason, right? Like there's people waving Ukrainian flags in the American Congress. Wait, that's called corruption. And we can't function properly as a society when the mechanisms are corrupt. So we can't probably, fi Val probably can't fix politics, um, but it can fix money. It can fix economics, right? By bringing back reality to to its audience. And that's um, that's one of the great, great values of Val. We you know, we, we speak about changing the world. We vow to change the world. How? By fixing money, by bringing back real money to the world. Bitcoin is real money, sort of. Vow is real money. And by bringing back real marketplaces through liquidity pools. What are we doing for part three, Eric? Do we need to do a part three? <laughs> You want to do a part three? We get, you know, I can talk for hours about this stuff. I mean, we can talk about TLN, uh, the amazing things that TLN is doing. So TLN is a sub project somebody created. I don't know. You know, it's, well, it's an ecosystem, right? Anyone can can build on top of it, and there's all kinds of stuff being built. So uh, we could talk about TLN next if you want. Um, yeah, I, 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 we'll we we'll, we'll chat about, about maybe doing TLN next. So uh, yeah. thanks for talking about Val, and we'll see Eric for part three. Bye, everyone.